Hello, and welcome to Listen Up People, a podcast of the USC Suzanne Dvorak Peck School of Social Work. I'm Dr. John Brecky, the Francis G. Larson Professor of Social Work Research. Today, we're tackling an issue that has been at the forefront of discussion in this country for a very long time, and recently has taken on some very interesting under and overtones, and that issue is immigration. But we're not going to rehash what's been in the media every day. We're going to explore more deeply the personal toll it takes on the mental health of the undocumented individuals and families. I'm joined in this discussion by my colleague, Dr. Concepcion Barrio, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for about 30 years. Um, She's an associate professor here at USC, who's a nationally recognized as an expert in mental health services research, particularly the interaction of of ethnicity and effective clinical practice. She is also the creator of a program housed at Los Angeles' Mexican Consulate, which is providing mental health care for immigrants and their families. We also have Dr. Paula Elu Brown with us, an assistant professor of psychology at Mount St. Mary's University, She is also the co-creator and coordinator of the program, uh, working with Dr. Barrio at the Mexican Consulate. Finally, Luis Juarez, who received his MSW from USC in 2017, was brought here by his parents as a young boy without legal documentation and remained undocumented until his early 20s. He is currently a clinician working with children and adolescents who are undocumented or who have parents who are undocumented. So it's a pleasure to have you all here. We have a tremendous amount of experience in this room, both personal experience as well as programs that are being developed. So just to begin with uh, one thought that I had about this discussion around immigration that's occurring in the United States now, it's always curious to me that Euro-Americans often talk as if they have no immigration history, which is really curious because, as we know, this is a country based on immigration. And so I, I've heard the stories in my own family. Um, on my father's side, uh, it was my great-grandfather who came from Norway, and he was fleeing famine and poverty there. So he came over as a farmer and went to northern Minnesota, speaking only Norwegian. And so my family began, at least on my father's side, there. And I, I never heard any discussion in our family history, our family story, about whether he was documented or undocumented, legal or illegal. And that's because when he came over here in the late 19th century, in the 1880s, there were no immigration policies or laws. The borders were open. Everyone was welcomed. In fact, they were given land to homestead and to farm. So that's a, gee, almost 200-year history in my family of, well, I'm sorry, 150 year history of, of that began with immigration. And as we know now, things have changed dramatically, both in terms of people's experience of immigration and our policies. So we're going to move forward with a, a more personal side of immigration. Luis, you've had a very interesting and poignant story about your own immigration experience. Would you be willing to just start talking about that? Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, so my experience um, started in the, the late 80s. My parents brought me here um, to the neighborhood of Echo Park. I grew up in Echo Park uh, when I was uh, starting at about five years old. And um, my experience of actually immigrating here is uh, very different from what we're seeing now, right? Where my family had the privilege of obtaining a, um, a visa. So I traveled, you know, what I call the you know, the Cadillac of uh, immigration, right, where I was actually on an airplane, I traveled here. Uh, nothing like what we see today with uh, the children literally crossing through deserts with their family and then only to be separated, right? I identify with a lot of uh, today's youth, right, because I grew up in L.A. Uh, during the, the 90s where we had uh, then-Governor Pete Wilson backing uh, Proposition 187. So it was uh, widely talked about. It was uh, very similar to today's uh, atmosphere where You know, we walk down the streets um, and just waiting at any moment to see that green uh, INS 
van, which is, you know, we, we now call that ice. Uh, so, you know, that's, I grew up with, uh, with fear, right? Always looking up over our shoulders. Uh, so that was very real. Uh, but even then, you know, it's very different from today where today we're talking about families being separated. I never really was worried about being separated from my family. Whether that was right or wrong, you know, um, I don't know, but I didn't have that fear. I knew that if we were ever deported, we'd be deported together. At least that's what I thought at, at the time. But my reality was a little different where um, I grew up here and uh, I never saw a future for myself past high school. I thought once I turned 18, if I was lucky enough to still be here in the United States, uh, because deportation was always you know, a very real possibility, um, I just uh, kind of ended up doing what my dad did at the time, which was uh, he, he, he was an auto mechanic working uh, on his own account. And that seemed like a viable future for myself. Um, so college was never really a thought. If it wasn't really for my mom who pushed hard, she, you know, she was always the one pushing for a higher education and never would have applied for college. I was always a good student just because that was just in my nature. I, I enjoyed school. Uh, so hearing about Prop 187, which one of the points was that uh, undocumented uh, students would not be allowed to obtain a, a public education, that was really painful and scary. So that was also kind of a way for me saying, you know, at any moment this can be taken away from me. So college was never an option. My mom uh, pushed and she pushed. You have to apply for college. I applied to one university, Cal State Northridge, and I got in. And as we know, you know, attending university is one way of climbing out of poverty, which we were. You know, we were uh, low income. I graduated uh, with my uh, BA in psychology and Chicano studies. Even at that point, though, I was still undocumented after I graduated. I had my uh, my passion for social, social justice and my passion for mental health, but I couldn't do anything with it. Uh, so what I did was I uh, worked for seven years after graduating in a completely unrelated field. Did not enjoy it, but guess what? I was grateful to have a job that paid me well enough. Uh, during that time, during those seven years, I got married, and really that's the only way I was able to obtain my uh, legal residency. Getting married just to obtain my papers was never an option. Um, I always, I think I'm a romantic at heart too, I wanted to uh, wait for that one person. And we met each other at Cal State Northridge, and we, uh, we had very similar views, similar uh, interests. We ended up getting married uh, at, when I was 25, so that was the only path to legal residency that really there is for for a lot of people. That's exactly how I've obtained my legal residency as yeah. well. Even though I was here on a student visa, mm -hmm. for me, as soon as my school was done, it was time for me to return. But during that process, I met my husband, now husband, mm -hmm. um, and we realized that if I wanted to stay, we had to get married. That was the only option as well. Right. It's interesting that you mentioned that. Yeah, because that's the only path, right? A lot of people yeah. believe that it's easy, that it's, it's easy to just get uh, get your legal residency. Uh, I hear a lot of people criticizing uh, undocumented folk. They have the audacity to say, well, if they just fix their papers, they wouldn't be in the situation. There is no path other than, than getting married. And for some, you know, some people have no problem doing that. That's, you know, that's fine. That's their prerogative. Um, but there's a lot of people who hold out because they believe that, you know, uh, getting married is, is a privilege that shouldn't be abused. Uh, but besides that, and that's really the only way I was able to pursue, you know, my uh, my graduate degree, my MSW, and, and get to where I am now, right, to be able to uh, work with, with uh, families who uh, need this, these services. And now it's, uh, it's really good to see that a lot of uh, undocumented um, young people are able to obtain these services because the laws in California have changed. So, Luis, you talked about your family. You said you had the Cadillac experience. Yeah. Explain that a, a bit more. And could you also talk a bit more about your family's experience? Because you yeah. said that you lived in fear of ICE and deportation. Did your parents experience the oh, same? Oh, definitely, yeah. So what I meant by the Cadillac experience is that I had the privilege because I came here on a visa to be able to travel on an airplane. Um, and if you know my family was not able to afford an airplane, we crossed the border legally and simply overstay that visa, right, which is what uh, ended up happening. I had no idea I was coming here to stay. You know, my, my parents uh, never uh, talked about that with me. I just thought we were visiting family. And we just happened to stay here for a very long time. <laughs> so what, what I call it a Cadillac visa because a lot of the, the kids that uh, I work with now, they're crossing deserts on foot. Uh, they're being separated from their families. That's what I meant by that, yeah. And so, yeah, my family, walking down the street when my parents would take me to school, my mom would take me to school, we were always in fear that just around that corner there might be that 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 uh, that van, right? Waiting for uh, for families. It's very true today too. You know, a lot of my families, uh, the families that I work with, they they've experienced that recently uh, in in the community where they live um, after the 2016 elections. 
And you can imagine what that cumulative experience of stress and anxiety does to people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I've learned is that currently, and is it's also probably true in the past, is that there are households with individuals with mixed legal status. Mm -hmm. So the parents may be undocumented, but maybe some of the children may be documented. So I, I think that that's probably your experience as well. But I see that in, in families that we help at the Mexican consulate mm -hmm. is that not all families have equal legal status. Right. So there's a lot of fear, uh, for example, adult children who may be uh, U.S. citizens, they, they fear that their parents might be deported. Mm -hmm. So I, I cannot even imagine what that might be like for... Oh, definitely. My sister was born here uh, in uh, 94. We had already been here for several years. My mom, dad, and I, we were undocumented, and my sister uh, was born a citizen here. Uh, growing up, you know, we didn't talk about things like that in front of her, so I think she grew up a little sheltered in that sense, where she wasn't aware of the dangers that, you know, that lay outside for us. It wasn't until maybe she was in high school uh, that uh, she started to become more aware of our limitations, right? Where we couldn't do certain things. We couldn't travel. Uh, we couldn't um, take her beyond a certain point uh, south of uh, Orange County because that's, you know, that's within the 150, 150 mile um, zone where the immigration services or ICE is, uh, they can apprehend people. You, know. you become very aware where all the checkpoints oh, are. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we couldn't visit family in Arizona, for example, right? Because we knew that there's a checkpoint in, in, in all those areas. And not even just visiting. I mean, going to funerals, oh. you know, big events, weddings, and so on. You can't you know, participate in that. It's really interesting you bring that up. Uh, after I became a resident, my grandma, my maternal grandmother, she passed away. And my mom could not visit her in El Paso. My mom still carries that with her to this day because she wasn't uh, able to travel. So, so I don't think she ever really uh, got a sense of closure. She wasn't able to um, see her mom while she was still ill in, in Texas. And then she wasn't able to attend the services in Mexico. So I know to this day she carries that with her. Could you describe that a little in a little more detail? Yeah, so when you travel, even interstate travel, right? Let's say you travel from here to, to Phoenix uh, or here to Texas. You're going to encounter some stops, some literal checkpoints uh, where you have ICE agents, or Border Patrol agents, actually, I should say, um, stopping traffic. Uh, it's, it's, they're controlled traffic stops uh, where they will ask you for your citizenship status. All they do really is ask you. They ask you if you're a citizen. And if you lie and you say you're a citizen, and they, for some reason, decide to take it further, then, you know, they can apprehend you and, and detain you and then, you know, be taken to a, a nice facility. So a And lot then of technically folks... you're a criminal. Oh, yeah, because you've lied. But even within the state. So, for example, we're mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. If you travel to San Diego, there's oh, yeah. a checkpoint. Oh, definitely. Yes. So people who are not documented, who are here in Los Angeles, never go to San Diego, never go to past Orange County, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and then sometimes when you board a plane, ICE agents can be there at any point randomly. They say randomly, but one time I was asked, and I said, why didn't you ask the German guy over there? And you asked me. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was wearing a, a Latino power kind of t-shirt at the time I was in college. <laughs> but um, so I had to pull out my green card at that point. Wow. I don't have a green card now. I am a naturalized citizen for the record. <laughs> So we have a situation now where families are being separated at the border. Mm -hmm. A horrific experience for any family. But you lived with a situation where your family could have been disintegrated at any moment. I mean, that has to lead to tremendous stress, sense of insecurity, both physical insecurity, but psychological insecurity for a family. And I, I suspect this is where your program began out of some of this experience that Luis is describing. Yes, at the Mexican consulate, um, they have what they call in Spanish ventanillas de salud. And ventanilla is like a window, but it's also like the counterpart would be like a teller, like a bank teller. And some of you may know in consulates, there's a whole bureaucratic process, lots of waiting. And at Mexican consulates all over the country, there have been this uh, the service of providing health services. But the Mexican consulate in Los Angeles is the first and only one at this point uh, providing mental health services. And this was uh, developed by 
Dr. Elu Brown and myself uh, with a lot of collaboration from the consulate and funded by the Mexican government. So we developed this program starting with uh, wanting to help Mexican immigrants, but the program is actually providing services to immigrants from anywhere. All they need to do is speak either Spanish or English, and we can provide services for them. The program initially was funded through a um, grant that the Mexican consulate obtained, and now the government of Mexico is... Um, providing some seed money for other consulates in other parts of the country to be able to begin providing some of these services. But like Dr. Barrio was saying, it is a, a lot of work um, collaborating with a lot of different uh, people, community providers as well. It's a, a team effort, if, if you will, being able to bring these services at no cost at all. It provides access to mental health care at the preventative level for people who are not necessarily there to access that kind of care. So it's destigmatizing and it takes away perhaps some of the fear in accessing services because we find that Mexican immigrants at the consulate have experienced all kinds of discrimination and are fearful even if they're eligible for health services. So health services, obviously, very important, but with the current sociopolitical climate, the mental health, which is a integral part of our overall health, is put at the, at the end of the line. And hopefully with this kind of creative outreach approach and accessible services, some of those barriers can, can be addressed. Is the populations or, or the populations that you're seeing at the consulate now, are they coming with visas, without visas, and a whole range of situations, I would imagine? The whole range of situations, yes. It is very common for people to overstay their visa. I mean, I know this also in the Filipino community mm -hmm. and, and another among other Asian immigrant groups in particular. But even Canadians and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what people do. Mm -hmm. But um, for Mexican origin individuals, because, I think because of the proximity of the, of the border and even the difficulty in acquiring a legal visa, they face the dramatic and very painful crossing uh, in, in various ways. And we also have to acknowledge that there is a very strong race component when it comes to immigration. And like um, Dr. Brecky, you were mentioning a lot of European Americans or people with European ancestry, they don't have to face, and I include myself because even though I'm, I was born in Mexico, I am of a European uh, and Middle Eastern descent, so I look white. And I acknowledge that my experience of migration has been completely different than a person who is a person of color that might be targeted and that when people think of immigrants, that's what comes to mind, particularly with the rhetoric that, that is taking place right now. And so we see that a lot of the folks that are coming to the consulate who are having the most aggressive and violent experiences of discrimination and alienation are people of color. The colorism factor is huge in terms of how it's feeding the current political climate because for the most part Latinos look different or there's a stereotype of Latinos and I think that's what is contributing to the the fear that oh my goodness we're losing our white American identity. But really, it's, I think it's a fear of the browning of America. Among families, I mean, I, like Paula, are a lighter tone, but in my family, we have all colors. I mean, that's just what happens in most families. So your, your program is the first in the country to deal with the mental health issues of Mexican immigrants that make it to the consulate. So that's a pioneering effort. We've received requests from across the country for information as to how we develop the model. So it, it means something. It's like, why wasn't this done before? I mean, Luis, you were talking about it earlier before we started the podcast. It's like, I never knew that, that mental health wasn't part of the services offered there. Growing up, I just always assumed that it was something that it was just logical, right? That it would um, be provided at the, at the consulates. 
and and then being here at uh, at USC in uh, 2016 and 2017, uh, speaking with some of the professors that were involved in, in that project, finding out that it was just now, you know, getting started and in, in, the, in the process of being developed was really surprising. There was an increase in the deportation of people who have not committed any crimes, which was not something that was happening before. We also have to be fair and acknowledge that the deportation and uh, criminalization of migration has been taking place long before this administration. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't forget that. However, it is the language surrounding it that is making this country very hostile, even for legal migrants. Um, it just feels definitely is a feeling every day of, I don't think I'm welcome. And that where I come from is taking more of a forefront uh, in conversations rather than what I am doing and who I am as a person. That's such a powerful point that that the issue of where you came from has become so electric and politicized as opposed to what you are doing and what you are contributing and where you are. Because we know that from most experiences of immigrants to this country, the vast majority are charging into the, into the halls of academia and universities and vocational schools and experiencing enormous upward mobility in this country, which is what the immigration experience was always meant to be. But your point, tied up with race, tied up with colorism, um, that is being just fueled by our political rhetoric from the White House. It's really, really devastating. And it's unfortunate that, uh, for the most part, people are not informed about the real benefits of immigration in our country. I would just direct people to look at the Center for American Progress, and it lists the facts on immigration for as of 2017. And there are 80 pages or more of the benefits of immigration, um, economic, social, uh, in, in, at, at all levels. For example, uh, very soon within the next 20 years, baby boomers are going to retire. And we need more people, younger people, to join the workforce. Also, those baby boomers are going to be older adults needing help. We need younger people, able-bodied individuals who want to work uh, as caregivers. That's just one example. I'm going to shift this just a little bit to say that a few decades ago in the late 80s, there was a huge study by Dr. Bill Vega and his colleagues on the prevalence of mental disorders in the United States. And at that time, that study uh, and many of his published articles from that study show that Mexican immigrants in particular, Mexican origin immigrants, were healthier when they came to the U.S. It's when they were more acculturated that they started to look more like the indigent population of the U.S. Now the trend is changing, which is very alarming. A new study that was published in the Journal of Clinical and Consulting Psychology shows that the prevalence of mental disorders among Mexican immigrants living near the border has increased. So they are no longer as healthy as their counterparts were in the 80s. So about 23% of uh, Mexican immigrants are um, experiencing serious depression and anxiety in particular. Could part of that be related to the difference in the immigration experience? I, I assume that's what underlies this, but is, would that be your thoughts about this? I, because the experience that Luis was talking about with his family, because of how things have changed in terms of immigration, is that what's contributing to this? To add on to what Dr. Lou Brown said, I think that is the case. It's just gotten to be a lot more um, externalized and I think people are more readily scapegoating immigrants and I know that during the time of Prop 187 I remember that time period and it mm -hmm. was palpable but I, I think that what we're living through now is 
just so alarming because you hear it every day in the news. You read it in the paper, you hear it in the radio, and it's just so much of what we consume every day. Plus, we have new policies and procedures that are that are actively, it appears to me at any rate, working against the health and the well-being of these immigrants. Mm-hmm. So I, I it's, it's agree. both political rhetoric, but it's actual policy mm-hmm. and procedure. Oh, yes. And there's uh, been numerous articles that have um, reported on how Latino immigrants or immigrants in general are foregoing seeking medical services of all kinds, not just mental health out of fear of deportation. And this is happening even in mixed status families where they fear that if the mother um, is documented, but let's say the father is not, that by them seeking services together, that the other person might get deported. So they are foregoing critical medical care, which, you know, of course, this is just me hypothesizing what might happen in the future. But if you forego uh, any of the preventive medical care right now, we could be looking at a generation of immigrants that are going to be much less healthy (laughs) than their um, ancestors or families were before because they're not getting the medical care right now that they need. Given the complexity of this problem, is counterposed with these remarkably simplistic, mean-spirited, devastating ideas like all we need to do is build a wall and all of these problems will go away. And I, I just wonder if you all would reflect on, on that kind of mentality that we have in this country now that is really devastating. I think that you're right, it's an oversimplification of the solution to just build a wall. And it's a much more complex issue. And I, I think that, you know, the pop, the American population is going through a change. Whether you like it or not, we are diverse, and we're becoming more diverse. And if we don't embrace that, and I think that's what the people that are for the wall is that they're not tuned into the reality of, of, of the world as it is now. So it is an over, oversimplification, and it's not a solution. It's possible that we have people who talk like that, who are from places where they have very little experience of diversity, or we have people that believe that who are experiencing diversity and see it only as a threat. It's it's so interesting because that has actually changed. I think in the, in the 1960s, uh, the majority of Latino immigrants were in the coasts, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, particularly in the Southwest and, and also in the, in the Eastern Coast. But it's changed now. I just traveled recently through, uh, North Carolina and everywhere I saw, almost everywhere in restaurants and I saw people working that were not typically Euro American looking. There's, um, a very interesting phenomena affecting, um, the conversation around immigration that has a lot to do with the increase or the growth of that gap between um, upper class and um, lower class white uh, Americans that um, they're looking for a group to scapegoat and why it is that they're experiencing the levels of poverty that they're experiencing, the lack of opportunities and jobs, the increase in the opioid crisis and just wanting to numb themselves. And it's easy for someone to come and say, it's them. I'm pointing the finger at the one that looks different from you. And that's who's who's responsible for what you're experiencing. And the problem is that a lot of the times these folks um, might not be aware of this um, way that propaganda is seeking to take the attention from the real issues of inequality that we are experiencing. And it's putting all the burden on the hardworking brown folks and immigrants that come here to just try and do better for their families. And so I also don't want to lack compassion for those people who are definitely in crisis. And I think um, as social workers, as mental health professionals, we also want to think of expanding our networks and trying to figure out where are we going wrong as a society that these people are in such despair that it's so easy for them to cling on to that, oh, they're the others, they're the bad guys, they're taking your jobs. Like, what what can we do? How can we shift this conversation? We're used to 
hearing all sorts of promises and uh, discussions when elections come about. I don't think we're at all used to the current atmosphere where hate is part of the campaigning process, right? And what we've unfortunately found is that it's a very powerful tool and it's effective. It's very effective. It's very easy to buy into simplistic um, ideologies like that, right? Because what you're talking about is the essential, the essential immigrant experience that would was at the core of the American experience. And it has become overlaid with this hatred of the other, this creation of the immigrant as the other, largely around colorization and race, and now religion, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That other dimension that has become so pernicious. The part of this discussion that's most problematic is in terms of policy, in, in terms of procedure, in terms of laws, uh, and in terms of just outright hatred, as you put it, Luis, what are your personal solutions in in that regard? I mean, when, I mean, we all have to have this discussion with ourselves. And if your Americans were honest with themselves, they would say, you know, this is my experience, and it was very different from my family. And what what's happening now is so wrong on so many levels. So you talked about changing the dialogue. How do we do that? Well, that's a big one. <laughs> It is such a complex issue. We deal with our own little section of it. Yeah. And so, well, I'm hoping that we can grow as Americans and transcend the issue of race and see, really see as we see it, diversity as a strength. That if you look at objectively at the country, the coasts are doing much better. Why? I choose to think it's because they're more diverse. Very interesting. I mean, not necessarily a solution, but I think we need to do our part. And the call for social justice and human rights, because we're dealing with human rights issues here. You know, to answer uh, your question of what my part of the solution is, right? Um, education. Uh, with my own clients, I always make it a point to explore uh, their interest in obtaining a higher education, right? Um, it's true, not everybody is uh, going to seek higher education, right? But I explore the reasons why, right? Um, for me, it was my status that did not allow me to literally see past high school. I explore these reasons with my own clients uh, because uh, in order for us to have a positive impact in our communities and, and challenge these ideology, uh, ideologies uh, of hate, uh, we need an educated community. We need an educated community because these these kids that I'm working with now, they're the future policymakers. Okay, um, they are the, the the folks who we see today in California and Los Angeles making policies that allow uh, our um, low income com communities to have access to to health that they wouldn't otherwise. Health services, I should say. If we don't have an educated community, uh, we don't have the power. To, to fight against these uh, policies of hate. I also wanted to add to that solution one one last thought um, uh, on a personal level regarding what I, I think maybe I, I can contribute or other people in similar situations can contribute is to not allow people to also turn you into the other. Um, I realize people always say, well, you came here legally. Well, you have an education. Well, if you did it, how is it that others um, don't can't do it? And so reminding them that just because I was able to do it and I had the privileges that allowed me to be here doesn't mean everybody is able to do it. And I almost... I almost say, how how dare you other me in that way where, where you're trying to extract me from the immigrant community by saying they're less worthy of being here because of their struggles and how the undocumented folks have been able to just fight and risk their lives to be here. And I think if, if and like Dr. Brakey did in the beginning of, of the podcast, just reminding everyone about their own immigration histories and saying, you know, we are immigrants. Unless you are a Native American, you are an immigrant. And you can't forget that. And if we allow people to make us forget that, then we are never going to dig ourselves out of this hole. This has been a very, very important discussion. And in, in some ways, while we've talked about this program that, that you have begun and the work that you are doing professionally, Luis, and the program that you have started, 
it, with the Mexican consulate, there's also a piece of this that's deeply personal and that we all have to look at how we are either contributing or not doing enough to change this very destructive political atmosphere we have around immigration in this country that is actually not congruent at all with what the history of our country has been. And hopefully people from this discussion can, can see that that personal part of this is, is as important as the work that you're doing to help immigrants that need help. And so congratulations on your program, the success of it. Hopefully you'll find more support. Uh, maybe someone listening to this podcast will have some ideas for you. That would be great. And Louise, thank you for sharing your story and, and talking about the, the professional work you do now. Your story is in so many ways the, the history of the immigrant experience in this country. Well, thank um, you for having me. Yeah, yeah it was wonderful. And it, it's certainly congruent with my own family's history. I want to thank Dr. Barrio and Dr. A. Lou Brown and Luis, who is a professional social worker now. If you have further questions for our guests on our show or just want to talk further about immigration, we'd love to hear from you at listenuppeople at usc.edu. You'll also find extended versions of this and all of our podcast episodes at dvorakpec.usc.edu forward slash listen up. 